Clubhouse. Welcome back to another episode of Tales from the Shogunate, a Shogun Companion podcast. This is for the seventh episode called A Stick of Time. This is Paul with Pod Clubhouse here again with Gabby and Inez. How are you guys doing this late night? Or I guess for Inez, it's just sort of like the middle of the day. <laughs> middle of the day, one hour behind you. <laughs> no, I'm doing great. Excited to talk about the episode. Excited yes. to talk about the bleakest episode so far. Ooh, I, Interesting yeah. you think that. <laughs> You don't think did it was think bleak? That, did you, you think that, Inez? I did not find it bleak whatsoever. I oh. found the... Uh, yeah. That's <laughs> I didn't exciting, find it, then. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't find it bleak. Hopefully, I, I watched the right one. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, yeah, stick of time. Was... <laughs> no, it, yeah. it was really great. I, I had a lot of appreciation for some of the layers that we saw, um, some of the subtleties that, that went on. And yeah, it is definitely a bleak in this tone but i just really enjoyed the flow i enjoyed the storytelling in this one wow i yeah i just disagree wholeheartedly whoa that's that's all <laughs> can't wait to dive in all right well then let's hit the synopsis real quick this episode began with a flashback to 46 years ago with young lord tornaga winning his first battle Yep, it started there. And then we finally meet Saiki, which is Tornoga's half-brother. Big doings with that guy. We were hoping for one thing, we got another. Later, the owner of the tea house and uh, Kiku's boss chats about seeing Kiku with Omi. Yes, and then next there was an important dinner where we learned that Saiki became a regent and that the town is now on lockdown. Until Toronaga surrenders. Oh yeah, he brought all kinds of good news with him. <laughs> so the big question of the day that he's given about a day and a half to sort out is, are they going to surrender and go to Osaka? Right, and then this episode, a bulk of it was everyone having their own thoughts about what to do from there. The Anjin, Blackthorn takes very much a back seat in this episode. In, in fact, it felt like they needed a reason to stick him in. So they gave him a couple scenes, including the one where he tries to come up with a scheme where he can steal his boat and then he doesn't know. Just steal his boat. That's the main thing. Oh my goodness, you are so funny. <laughs> yeah, everyone has their thoughts. And I did think that he was significant, but mo moving right along. Yeah, Omi and Naga have a conversation in the spring where Saiki walks in on them and reminds them that they're still family. Buntaro, in the middle of Toranaga needing to think very hard about what to do with the future of himself and his clan, Buntaro thinks it's important to stop him and ask if he can kill Blackthorn. <laughs> yeah, that was that was really good. And then um, Toranaga, what did he do? What did Toranaga decide was going to happen, Paul? He oh, surrendered. He surrendered. He surrendered. And best for last. Best for last, there's a uh, pillowing scene followed by an assassination attempt on Saiki by one Nagakado. Yeah, and then that led us to the very end. Stress I... attempt. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to deep dive into this because I thought it was so intense. It was intense. I'm not going to confuse anybody and go out of order this week. We're just going <laughs> to so, so. just follow the episode's order as best as we can, starting with that cool opening scene. Maybe we will just add as a stinger onto that the truth of the matter of Tornaga becoming the surrendering Lord's second and how that actually went down versus how it went down in Legend. Mm -hmm. I thought that there was like a lot of emphasis on time and fate in this episode. And so mm -hmm. I, I was hoping to get your thoughts on how the meditation on that moment of time was significant with relating to that theme of, of, 
of fate in this episode. I thought that those flashbacks were excellent in like helping us remember that these people, the regents, they were born into war. And I think that the fact that they were born into war and his flashbacks were just showing that he like was a young child already fighting in intense wars. And then you have people like Omi and Naga who've never fought in a war and they're much older. For me, it just really emphasized how much Toronaga is like over war. <laughs> so what he's been through versus the childlike anticipation that the Nagakado thinks the war is going to be glorious and beautiful, whereas the reality of it is that sometimes it takes nine strokes to get a guy's head off, and that's not glorious at all. He was only 12 when he when that happened. Like, that's, that's incredibly traumatizing, first of all, but with how whatever he's had to do, right, is just, like, suppress everything. So we've gotten a lot of the storyline of, like, how the women suppress their entire existence, and we've been empathizing with them. And so this, to me, was kind of an opportunity to, like Gabby said, you know, that the kind reminder that the Toronagas, the Buntaros, you know, the Yabus, like they've been doing this their entire life and they also had to suppress a lot of things just to be able to get through the next one. And also, you know, shows like the rootedness of like why Toronaga is such a brilliant strategist too, because he's literally like his entire existence mm -hmm, <laughs> has been this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it also shows um, like the three different ways war can affect you. So you have Toronaga, who is just quiet and not schemy, but strategic and kind of solemn <laughs> all the time or stoic. And then you have Yabu, who is definitely the most expressive and also able to live in the present. And then you have Buntaro, who is just that soldier who's kind of wearing it you can see the wear and tear he's the only one who's outwardly showing what he's been through yeah that's true we got to see all of his all of his guys even uh hiromatsu in his in a scene coming up who we haven't gotten to see all that much and it's only been in the role of advisor in general but we haven't gotten to, gotten to see him as either buntaro's father or fuji's grandfather until pretty much now his scene with Fuji was touching and sad because, yeah, it was it was more emotional. You're seeing the layers peel back. Well, that scene and and Jin's scene with Toranaga and maybe maybe even Kiku's scene at the end, they're starting to to roll women into understanding a lot more than they're exposed to more, I think, than they had in previous episodes. I didn't really catch on to that until just right now, but Fuji said a lot of in intelligent things to Hiramatsu and we're left with a, a look in that scene where Hiramatsu is skeptical of, of all of her apologies and speaking out of turn and all that because she's pretty much called it that she's identified that her side's not going to win, <laughs> right? In interesting. So you said that these women are finally sounding intelligent. Um, did, <laughs> were you getting the opposite idea? No, they far? haven't. No, no. What, they haven't been given the chance to sound intelligent yet, like on screen. Oh, right. They've, they've okay. played the subservient role, keeping the house, et cetera, et cetera. But, but their opinions haven't, except for Mariko, have not really, and Ochiba, um, haven't been allowed to be expressed exactly. But in this episode, that happened several times. Well, they haven't been verbally expressed, but I, I definitely have been catching on to the nonverbal expression and the um, being aware. At least, I, I mean, I, I thought that they were all really smart and aware and subtle because, yeah, they have their place and they don't want to die. Yeah, I think it's kind of um, like you already kind of give them that respect of that when you see how disciplined they are in following their roles and keeping themselves in check and keeping others in check. And even Mariko, how she's been teaching Anjin about these differences and whatnot. Like when you see that they're like excelling and being exceptional at their role as what they expected them as a courtesan, as a wife, as a servant, then, you know, I don't know. I think it's just kind of like automatically does translate into like, we know that there's a lot of depth and we're not seeing it, but because we see them constantly demonstrate excellence here, like, of course, there would be applying, you know, their in excellence and in, in their knowledge and, 
you know, you just, <laughs> you just kind of automatically transfer that well, respect over. Apparently not everybody, just women would identify that because that makes sense that it just like went right over Paul's head. <laughs> well, I mean, like they're not, they're not getting that kind of frontline information. Um, not for, explicitly. Firsthand, right. right. Well, Kiku was in the room with like with Yabu, like she's been in the room hanging out with them while they're like talking. So like they kind of like just forget that she is like a whole person with a whole brain (laughs) and can do stuff. Right. And so they're just and she's just like, you know, she's listening in and she's formulating her thoughts. She knows how and especially if she's like the best of the best and she's like banging all of the like top people, you know, like she's she's got all this big picture information that they just kind of all dismiss because she is a woman that's kind of like a power that women have like if they're going to be in this kind of oppressive role like that like that you know these they're these are very very capable intelligent women but kiko was in some of these rooms and i think like some of them and a gin was emboldened enough to like have a conversation with Shogunaga because she is a smart, capable businesswoman who came from nothing. You heard her story here, which was really great. And she tells in this journey and she's now the most successful woman like mm-hmm. in their area and their space. And so she's coming with the business proposal because Torinaga is a businessman and selling her case and doing her pitch with her one stick of time. <laughs> um, oh my God, yeah, I can't wait. Can't wait to get on that. Oh my God. <laughs> Yes. All right. Well, we jumped ahead a little bit there. His brother, to me, was giving off big Lando Calrissian vibes, like getting around, punching him on the shoulder, making him remember oh, yeah. em- embarrassing stories. It, w- it was like, I mean, haven't you guys seen The Empire Strikes Back, Toranaga? Don't you know what's going to happen <laughs> when a guy comes on so strong yeah. like that at the beginning? He's just so happy to see him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I thought that that scene was really cool. Actually, every scene with his brother, um, Saiki. Saiki. Saiki, yes. So I really appreciated how um, when he, like, he's silver. His people are silver. Their wardrobes and their armor is silver. And so it's really cool when he's walking and you see that whole path. It looks like a cape. His army is just, like, his cape. And that just shows, like, a symbolic, like, power that he puts himself in or, or has. Yeah, it was so cool. I loved the costumes mm-hmm. that they had. The silver color was such a brilliant, like, contrast. Really yeah, because yeah, in all of the cinematography scenes that you see throughout the episode of Psyche's army, it's just so, it's just another, like, art. <laughs> it's, you know, yeah. you've seen it funneling through and it's so clear because you see their mm-hmm. colors, right? Um, it was just really beautiful. But it, it was kind of like a, a little bit more predictable, right? I kind of felt also like I wasn't fully trusting the situation because of that. And maybe it was, it, I didn't like say it directly in my head. I just felt like this feels familiar. So I get what you were saying. Lando, totally Lando. Well, so I watched it with a different perspective. I was just, I was here for it. <laughs> you wanted it's not to trust until him? afterwards. Yeah, yeah. In the beginning, I'm like, heck yeah, we need you. We need I wa- you to win I this was one too. Yeah, I was all about it too. But I, I did have a little bit lingering in my back of my head. But I wanted, I want this story to like roll out. My right now, even though I know the last couple episodes we've been like, you know, maybe Torinaga's like the bad guy, <laughs> or you know, or something. not the maybe. bad guy. But oh, this yeah, is his no. grand plan. <laughs> right, like he, he's got something else going on, and we've kind of been a little bit sus about him but i still want him to win because i love mariko and i really love blackthorn and i freaking love yabu <laughs> but, you know so by this point by this way i'm bonded so i also wanted this uh agreement this alliance to to be real but i did feel that hitch bit of uncertainty so that when it did happen later on i was just like okay well i knew it could have gone either way i guess so actually before this scene was like the, the original scene, which was the flashback. And I just wanted to touch on that really quickly because you brought up Inez that we've been talking about how he's just like a schemer and this is his grand plan. And is he a protagonist, antagonist, blah, blah, blah. But the opening scene, I think really set the tone for me. You know, he was 12 years old and he was really serious like he was a man like war separates the men from the boys. I mean, being such a young one, being born into war 
it really emphasized the fact that I do believe wholeheartedly that Toronaga wants war to end. I think that he has absolutely wanted to become Shogun. He keeps saying he doesn't want to, and I do believe him. He does not want it. However, he knows that he has to be it in order to end wars. This opening scene for me really hit that right on the head. He just looks like he's just tired of death being a part of life. And he's tired of war being the natural way of the world. And so that in the very beginning set the stage for me. So when I saw the next scene, which was the one we're talking about, where he saw his brother, like I just was carrying this weight of desperation to end it and doing whatever you possibly can and pulling all of your tricks. So yeah, I just saw him as like empowered and I'm just, I was just assuming that all of this is part of his plan. Imagine like 50, almost 50 years of watching people like seppuku, like and fight and get their head chops up. Like they've showed us a lot of intense graphic ways that people died in this late 1500s to present 1600. And it's really freaking gruesome. We even got like a reminder of the boiling pot in this episode, right? Like that's a, that's a, I really appreciated that they got to finally show us like the seppuku part. Like I've seen different kinds of scenes, but the show is just kind of staying consistent in punk, you know, punching that shock value of this like ultra realism type of thing. And oh my God, that was like so intense. And that's like his entire life. So yeah, Gabby, I uh, agree. Like it's just, it's like, come on people. Like I just want us to stop fighting. If you want to see more scenes of Japanese torture, go see Martin Scorsese's Silence. <laughs> it takes place in 1620-something, and um, they have kicked out all the Christians at that point. They're like, fuck this, we're done with Christianity, get out of here. But there are, there are scenes of people clinging to Christianity, and so this is... There's scenes of the, how, what happens to you if you decide to do that? They have very inventive tools for hot springs to um, make the pain last longer for things that they do. It's not like it's just like a cup of hot spring water that they pour on you. That would go by too fast. They have it on like a stick and it's got holes in it, like something you might use to water your garden. And then they fill that up and hold that over your face for as long as it takes to empty out. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's just like one thing that they do anyway i yeah. don't know what got me going on that i'm just thinking <laughs> I'm just it's saying. it's intense it's the whole thing is intense fucking people when they decide to yeah. do something yeah. and, and so in tornaga i think it was tornaga right who says like why is it that those who've never seen battle are so eager to be in one because he's listening to the young guns like be really gung-ho about all of this and it I mean it rings true i don't know why this happens i'm i've never participated in war i didn't join the military Terry. But I did have some classmates who, when they returned from their military service, were complaining that they did all this training and they went out there and they didn't actually get to kill anybody. I believe that's a common thing. It's insanity to me, right? But it's because they don't like see like what what the real cost is. Um, I mm -hmm. think, and I appreciated that this this show is keep like really makes it really fucking clear what the cost of war is. And it's even though know, we're watching the version 1600, but this still translates to 2024 versions of war. It's brutal. It's disgusting. It's terrifying. It's sad. Um, and, uh, and people like still to this day are still having this mentality. <laughs> it's crazy. So before we go on, I should admit that I did finish the book. So I do know how the Yay! book ends. However, from this episode, I can tell you that they changed some stuff already that will likely force a lot of changes later. So my knowledge of how the book ends, I don't think it's going to do much for me in knowing how the show is going to end. I can tell you some, some subtle changes that they made where they didn't just flat out go a completely different direction. But I just thought I should admit that rather than sounding like some sort of like soothsayer. Oh, like, I, I know that I don't think that's going to happen. No, I, it's just because I finished the book. But uh, <laughs> but I think it's totally different. Yeah. And I do know that it's different from the history that it's based on now. They're taking creative um, 
freedom to like condense everything, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. So yeah, here we go on this adventure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, right after they, after they meet, they like, let's move it right along on the show. There's a lot that happened. You thought it was bleak. I thought like the next part, I thought it was interesting that Toronaga, um, so what's suspicious for me was that Toronaga said that he wanted to drink first. Like, we don't have to talk about anything. Let's like let loose because that's just like a new, new thing for him. You don't see him being casual. Well, the society's so tied up in politeness and manners and stuff. I can't say with any historical certainty that this is the way it was done, but it wouldn't surprise me if that was the way it was done. Everything is very unhurried, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. he, he's True. he's given he's given a very long time to make this decision. Could you imagine that in like an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie? Yeah, I'll give you a day to think about it, sure. Or would it be like, you decide right now? <laughs> they are reasonable people, okay? <laughs> very unhurried. Even even the the nature of the last scene, right? Um, hanging out for another night at Kiku's house, like what? <laughs> is that how is that how things would really run today? No way, I don't think so. But um, that's yeah. the way it was done, and so I I would bet that the drinking beforehand was just the way affairs of state were handled in you know, a certain mm -hmm. level of propriety. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I know like like in Game of Thrones. We, we kept hearing like the etiquette of like when you invite somebody in and the host, you know, offers like bread and or like food and drink, then that's kind of like a known truce, like of safety. So like if anything comes to harm to the guests at that point, then, um, you know, that's a like a betrayal. We saw that with House Frey. Um, in GOT with the Red Wedding. Oh, um, I thought we should focus on this. But, <laughs> well, so, well, we so I think that, of that name. So, like, you know, so just kind of going along with this, we've seen like parallels with like those medieval um, um, European societies have the similar rules. So, I think that that's warranted too. But I was, I was thinking, I don't know if I was thinking that this was kind of like a hosting thing. I felt like he's got so much intentionality, he's a strategist. Um, I feel like he probably was just buying time to see who his half, who his half brother yeah, was actually loyalty to so that he, and he didn't want to reveal his plan or his decision until he had a specific set of data and he got it after his brother Saiki was drinking, um, okay. and, and did that. Right. So that's kind of where I was thinking that he was bringing like, you know, because I caught it too, Gabby. Like, it's not as common to see him, um, be, you know, let himself drink Tornaga. Yeah, who knows if he actually did drink. Okay, so I have a theory. And I can I just say it right here in the beginning or should I wait till the end? Go for it. Uh, I mean, no time like the present. Excellent. All right. So I think that this is all staged. I think it's a facade and that um, the brother did have his conversation with Ishido and they did make their thing, but he's playing both sides and he's going to march. He was planning on marching back with um, Todoranaga and then that's when they attack Osaka. Interesting theory. That's what I think. So mm. that's why the, the beginning part, like where, like, I think all of this is for show and um, that meeting um, in the, with the dinner uh, yeah, is just to make sure, is to emphasize they had to have all of this happen in public because I think that Toronaga fears a spy like relaying anything different to Ishido before he makes it over there. That's a really interesting theory. And we know that, you know, if Ishido is looking for the strongest daimyos around to bring in to support him, and he had been wheeling and dealing with Yabu up to this point, but we know how that went. Mm -hmm. If Z Zaiki is bringing the head of the general that he sent to entreaty with mm -hmm. um, Ishido comes back in a, in a box, then we must know that he decided that Saiki was a stronger play. 
Mm-hmm. We'll put a pin in that theory. That's that's not a bad theory. Mm-hmm. Well, like it. it does come up, and I did see like some other clues throughout the show that made that led me to believe that. So we can go on. <laughs> we can go on. Okay. All right. Are you ready to talk about like the scene, say, where Tornaga is having to deal with all this? stuff in his tent something like admin he's like talking to mariko about about uh, kiku he's talking to blackthorn about this and that you ready to talk about that scene so i think it was cool that Gein, right like she's the 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 head madam yes right i think it was really cool that she negotiated her meeting with toronaga yeah that's the beginning of that next part where she yes. neg- where she told mariko yeah okay so yeah we could totally Go that negotiation negotiation actually played out in the book because it was it was a charming second appearance of Mariko trying to you know match negotiation skills with the madam, and since she had done it once before, but it wasn't for this Saiki thing. It was to actually purchase Kiku's contract outright, like forever, to become one of Tornaga's people. Hmm. Yeah, so the nature Wait. of the negotiation was different. She wanted Kiku to become part of Toronaga's. No, crew? she made she put the price really high, and Mariko had to try to negotiate down because it was basically like years of income all in one price that she was asking for. But the stick of time was part of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> was it a really big stick? <laughs> that stick was small from that scene. I, I, I assume that a stick of time is a pretty standard measurement but yeah. it worked out to be like five I, I minutes bet that it-, <laughs> it, was, yeah, it was short it burned fast real quick though just like one tiny little detail that i really appreciated that i enjoyed was when like um Toronago was going to meet his brother and he like told or no 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 no. this is after yeah this is in the meeting right the meeting where he starts listening to every, his hr moment right mm-hmm. i think it's funny that like he wanted to remind blackthorn to carry his swords um, because he's like, you're making me look bad. Like you are Hatamoto. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, there was a few scenes like that. Make sure he shuts up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really like that part too, because he's always asking questions and they're like, like, gosh, let's get serious now. Yeah. On that note, I thought it was very interesting, um, that we saw Torunaga get really aggressive about referring to Blackthorn as a barbarian. I thought it was very telling. Um, I I think we spent a lot of time early on um, wondering or hearing him be, you know, bestow these gifts. And then suddenly, like he's over here in the conversation with Mariko and he keeps saying he's my Hatamoto to everybody else. And then Mariko's like, you you know, keep the barbarian in line or you tell the barbarian this, this, this. And um, I think that was kind of one of those little reveals that we see of um, like Todanago's like real feelings. Because I feel like it's been very subtle in the last episodes whenever he's kind of broken from like his brand image and made these kind of mistakes. And um, I think like this one was one of those where he reveals like that the Haramoto respect is like not actually a hundred percent commitment. It's, it really is a facade. One other thing though, is that Toronaga, like the fact that he's no, he's made like no decision regarding Blackthorn and his service. Um, he doesn't, I think he wants to keep, um blackthorn safe because he knows that he's valuable but and, and it's like i also think that so we're talking about historically like whether this is something that like really made a difference in them winning or not i'm on the team that it he did make a difference and i completely understand why like it would appear that he didn't um because i do think that blackthorn and his um strategy just his way of thinking in general is so different from their culture he's about like act now and so doing something is better than nothing and he's just comes uh, create from a creative like perspective compared to like theirs and i think that toronaga finds that really valuable especially for like the future of japan after they've all um after he's passed on and and like all of the wars are over, I think he knows that Blackthorn being there is important. So I think I think that Blackthorn is important for like the shift in the culture and the future of Japan. 
I don't want to cast any weird aspersions based on my book knowledge and what my fleeting brain cells can well, remember. Well, pretend, pretend that it never happened. Pretend you are here in the present, Paul. Yeah, but is it, <laughs> is it my fate to cheat and talk about book things? Why don't you just throw... Oh, wait, in, in the book? No, you can talk about the book and like this part. And if you want, you can throw us off. You can lie. You can say what you wanted. Hmm. The world is your oyster, Paul. Okay. I think you're 100% right. Maybe the details are askew, but in broad strokes, I'm pretty sure you're right. Although I don't think that he... I mean, I think they will make him matter in the show in some way that will make him worth having been in the show. <laughs> but, yeah, but, I mean, that's like his whole relationship with Mariko, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, just the whole way that the book ended just surprised me because if they sold the idea of creating a show from the book and didn't change the way that they ended it, I would just be surprised. I would just be completely surprised because of the way that it ended and, and the way it, what happens with the characters, including Blackthorn and his importance to Tornaga. I do think it is like you're seeing it, Gabby, and have seen it for the last couple podcasts, part of a bigger scheme that Tornaga didn't know that he needed an Anjin, but now that he's got one, he wants to keep him. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Keep him safe. Anjin, just shut up. Stop complaining. Pretty much. Just be happy. Have everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, soon after that, right? It was really sad when Hiromatsu, like, brought um, the ashes, the remains. He reunited Fuji. Well, and that discussion does not take place in the book at all. I thought that that was a really nice way to expand on Hiromatsu's character. Because that discussion does take place, but it does takes place with Tornaga. Um, so it's nice to give it to Hiromatsu, plus give us like that deeper insight into what the townspeople, even the women, are understanding about what's going on <laughs> and how, how bad their chances are. But also the element of when my service is done, I would also like to be done. That's a thing. And that's an interesting factor for both her and Mariko, Mariko. is finally getting to that point where someone will let me die, God damn it! <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh yeah, my God. It's really sad. It's just so sad. Like that, how much pain they, how much internalized pain they're constantly carrying to like, just, just keep every day, just like wishing and hoping for the end to come. It's really sad. It's not a trivial thing. I know I might have made light of it, but we didn't get to see the relationship with her dead husband and her and her, and her baby. But the sense of duty to her liege lord is this really overriding thing that if she was just left to her own grief, she would have killed herself weeks ago. Exactly. And that's probably the case for every single woman. And we're just getting like a glimpse out of like two of those people. Or do you think yeah, that it's the women in these like higher positions that maybe hate their lives even more? I mean, Jin said, what did she it's say? It's Gein. Is it Gein? Oh, okay. I heard Paul say Jin earlier, so I thought it was it's Jin. It's Belgian in yeah. English. So Gein? Gein? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, so Gein, you know, she was, she actually revealed, um, some of that vulnerability to Tornaga at like the opening part of her, um, her, her stick, her, her stick window. Um, she, and she opened up with just like how the ladies of the Willow world, right. She's uh, talking about the Willow world and what it means and what it does to the women and how it like, you know, d how they are, you know, stripped of the stuff and what's going on inside him. And he was so, he just is like so invisibly annoyed and dismissive. Um, and that was like a real, like authentic story and then when she realized that like his his um behavior on it was not favorable in like going the authentic route then she and with her time crunch she switched it up and started talking like from a business value perspective um oh, so yeah. i mean yeah so it goes down to there too but like just bringing it back to that scene um when Hiromatsu is talking to his granddaughter. I really liked how they, how she said, how she really, remi she reminded us that Buntaro is his son and she is the grandchild. 
everyone's related. Like I forgot about that. <laughs> and, yeah. and then you remember everything that you've experienced right between these people. And it like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like family is just like, who's allowed to be in this household and who's not right. Like Fuji was saved because she's related to Hiromatsu. It's not like, Oh, this is my brother. Like we're, f- we're a family We're we have a life together. No. Like, so that was really a nice um, window into like the culture um, and, a yeah, sad reminder of life then. But I think it was really important when she, um, mentioned we, Paul, you brought that up where she says, we are united again. When my service is complete, I will end my life and join them as ashes too. And then he showed that he cared about her. I thought when he said, why not choose to live? If you can bask in the victory they died to achieve. And again, that was a glimpse of like the male perspective. They are doing this for greater good and they live like to carry on the, the purpose and she being a woman and have like being at war with that perspective constantly, it's just like living for her is too hard. There is no, um, there is no greater good for her because she's just a tool for the men to reach their goal. And so that was deeply saddening to me. And then of course she responded with like, you know, how do you know that there will be victory to bask in? And, and Paul, you're right. He did look at her. Like she was crazy. Like what you have a brain, what's going on? Like, stop talking again. At least that's the vibe that I got. <laughs> well, yeah, she had mentioned Buntaro as like the great soldier that might help lead the way to victory in that discussion. And that's when I think when he gave the look like, what are you talking about, Willis? Uh, that's a that's a Gen X reference to an old TV show. <laughs> I used to say it all the time. <laughs> what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> yeah, but it, it was a funny look. And a lot of things could be housed in there. Like, how would you know such a thing? Or, or like... Ah, yeah. Buntaro, I, I, you, like it's, it's, oh. it's never really underlined in this show, but it is mentioned in the book that they are father and son. But I guess when you're an important guy and you've got several consorts, you got a lot of sons, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so this, he was never a favored son, and he's not. I now. wrote down. Um, Gav, I referenced the same quote that Gabby just said: "Bask in the glory that they died to achieve." And I just wrote, you know, that is some gas lighting bullshit uh, for, for, for these women. Like, you know, the fact that I know that it's all cultural, but this is like a, a tool, a gas lighting tool that they're using to like further control the women and keep them in line from, um, for focusing on their roles on how the men need to use them. Not really for like an honor of like, I didn't take it as like, he was, like as an honor for that. I'm sure, I guess I, I do believe he's genuinely really devastated and sad about the baby like going to, but also him being like a man who's been in all these wars. Also, mm-hmm. there's an element of desensitization from about death and he doesn't live the wom- a woman's life. So when he said that, I actually just took that as like the cultural conditioning of gaslighting them so that they just stay in their lane, like trying to resubdue her focus interesting i thought well hiromatsu to me his role has been like kind of the emotional like relief especially with toronaga because toronaga when he's with him when he's with hiromatsu like does show us more of like because he's with an equal and he's the only person that he does actually trust and so i i feel like he's kind of like the emotional or empathetic person (laughs) um And so I thought that, like, because when he talks to, um, when he talks to Toronaga, like, that's when you see Toronaga smile. You see him smile. He's the one that brings in, like, the the life part, not just the duty part. Toronaga is all about duty. This guy's not so intense as that. So, yeah, interesting that you felt that way because I was, I was feeling vulnerability. Very, very, very slight maybe glimpse maybe i, I think was just that hopeful. watching i think watching toranaga kind of just continuously be so dismissive on like a lot of like things and then him being so readily calling blackthorn a barbarian again and he hasn't done that consistently in a while um and it's just this like you know this other guy he's still just like a guy who is running things for another guy and so that's just yeah that was like where that came from yeah except he's not the leader he's not the top top right so he's not as lonely as the top top 
he's next in line. Not that he would inherit anything, but as the general, he's, Mm -hmm. I think he's the general of his generals, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe he comes. Anyway, (laughs) but yeah, so (sighs) this conversation was, was plenty, right? Buntaro also, is that when Buntaro showed up? No, that's later. So what was next? Do you remember? Yeah, well, I mean, there's just a short scene of Naga expressing his desire to get into a fight. Um, oh, yeah. So just when a they... quick scene. Wait, this is when um, the brother went to the spring to take a bath, right? Yeah. I mean, the emphasis of Naga Nagakado in this... Um, in this episode, I think was really important considering like how it ended. I had no idea this was going to be a Naga episode, even though, I mean, it was, it was, there was a lot more Naga than usual, but I didn't really know this was going to be like his, his thing. Yeah. So right. When they were in there, Naga Kato said, like, I heard that a first kill is better than a first woman. And okay. Yeah. So this was really interesting to me because that's when Saiki, he was like, well, who told you that? Or no, no, no. It was Yabu who said, who told you that? So it's funny that you saw those three men, right? You saw, um, well, I mean, Omi was there too, but it seemed like Saiki and Yabu both like, um, are, you know, they're older generation and they seem like they don't want to go to war. Like they just want to live. But I I think it's nice. Yabu really like won me over in this episode. He was just so great and <laughs> yes. so funny. And he's like living in the present. He's perfected like life during that time. You know, he does what he needs to do to like smile <laughs> and nobody else gets that. But we saw um, Saiki and he's he every single time someone mentions like or Naga talks about like wanting to die. You have you have these men, including Saiki, who are saying like, okay, yeah, like, okay, you're okay, rookie, or I don't want that. He keeps talking about how he doesn't like that. And so that's why I think that was like more foreshadow toward like him wanting to do what it takes with Toronaga in order to make sure that the war ends, that all wars end. So I think that that scene for me was important because it was just like another reinforcement of like them being on the same page. Yeah, well, and it helped create what we needed to think of Naga leading up to that final scene. We need, you know, we mm-hmm. needed to know this about him even more so than maybe we got from the previous scene with uh, Josen and mm-hmm. mowing him down with the cannons. Oh yeah, yeah, him getting trigger happy for sure. Um, right. So that was a really, really short scene that like led right into the um, the, the big, dining, the big right? banquet. Yes. Yeah, and during that banquet, we saw um, Buntaro being really jealous and Omi egging it on. Like, I did see Omi just planting little seeds. He's like a little instigator, I thought. Now that you mentioned, he was like, hey, your wife looks like she enjoys her job, doesn't she? Uh (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So um, Nagakado and Yabu in that scene. um, So this is like the first time that you see all of the allies, I thought, like in one room at the same time. And I thought that was really neat because when one person's talking, um, you see Blackthorn and Mariko. Like you don't hear what they're saying, but you can see them discussing something. And this is the first time that that's happened where everything is not being like directly translated in that moment. And so... um, yeah, Nagakado and Yabu were really present and enjoying the storytelling. Everyone else seemed a little bit uncomfortable, but those two didn't. So I found that to be a little, like, to be significant. Yeah, I mean, obviously everything, like, turned around, right, when the storytelling started happening. It's interesting. Like, if in my own life, my own life experiences, if if I were at a gathering and say my (laughs) father decided to tell an embarrassing story about me i wouldn't necessarily know that i was getting double crossed right then because that happens all the time (laughs) but i guess if you're (laughs) if if you're the lead's lord and your brother comes and starts talking about sometime you were a kid and you shit your pants well that's a bad omen yeah so we got this brother's dying yeah brother's there he's got the scrolls that he tosses at hiramatsu very disrespectful 
with the orders to come to Osaka. Saiki's a regent. And by the way, Naga, go kill yourself. Oh my God. And then he's like, okay, that was, that made me really sad when he was about to reach for it. And then, um, you know, Toronaga told him to stop because you really felt the care. I think care for, I mean, this is like his son, right? So he needs to carry on everything, yeah. but also disappointment, care in the disappointment of like, you're going to fuck everything up. And then why, why are you going to fuck everything up? Just an impetuous youth. It's, it's almost like I'm getting served. For you. It's like, oh, getting, wait. it's like getting served, right? If you don't accept the, uh, the summons, you don't have to go in apparently. And, and in this case, that's how it works for Naga. Well, after that, the writing's on the wall, though, right? Blackthorn, he wants to bolt. He's trying to think of ways to get out of there. From that point, like the rest of the episode, which we'll talk about in turn, but it's all kind of these short scenes, meditations on accepting fate, like is this or or not? I thought anyway. Mm-hmm. I'm sure Gabby has a completely, totally different opinion, but um, you got that right. <laughs> but uh, that's what I got was just uh, like like Yabu getting the the head of his general back the wheelings and dealings as from how he must see it they must be done he has to accept the fact that his fate now lies with tornaga and his decision so mm-hmm. now that's where we get freewheeling yabu you know taking a bath in front of the enemy sword fighting on the beach with blackthorn etc etc he's he's now able to live every day like it's his last because they might be <laughs> Yeah, you, that was such a romantic little montage right there. Thank you. Yeah, it um, really was. I was like following it in my mind, like this like beautiful hazy dainty. thing. And, yeah, it was yeah. so good, Paul. Yabu Your voice is like made paw. for this. <laughs> Just I liked it. With on the beach. <laughs> I was like, all right, yeah. Yabu. Oh my gosh, no, the rest of the episode being about contemplation was really cool, and it kept me really entertained. Um, Fuji though. She looked really suspicious um, and she, you know, started like she started practicing like for fighting, you know, oh, yeah, we're seeing yeah, a different yeah. side of everybody. And apparently she knows how to fight. So what we saw is just that she was hurt because they, they definitely told us that she's hurt. She can't practice. Well, they didn't elaborate in the show, but what her injury was, was burns. So she has like scars up and down her legs. Burns? Burns, like like scar tissue. Yeah. Yeah, that was the injury she she sustained in the book anyway, and that oh would... because of the quake. Yes. So that was yeah that was her. So she's planning to prepare right. So everybody is contemplating and then taking action. And what is their action? And so hers was I'm ready to fight because I'm going to fight for something and accomplish that so that I can die. And then Anjan was just like, this is crazy. I need to get to my ship, right? That's what I know. That's what I want to do. Doing something's better than nothing. And then Mariko, I found that she just really showed more of herself of like, not because I mean, when she was talking to um, Anjan, right? She Mm -hmm. finished his sentence and said like, okay, and then we leave. And then where do we go? So that was, I felt like that was hers, which is just like, we are here. left. Like, like this discussion's over. <laughs> this isn't going anywhere, dummy. <laughs> yeah. And so she just seemed the most defeated and ready to take on whatever there is. Like, she wants to be the first one to die. I felt. And Todonaga was just having flashbacks and his flashbacks were going like back to being 12, which was a big emphasis for me of like, this has been my whole life. This needs to end. Um, I thought it was cool that Yabu laughed when he received the general's head. Um, that was how he took it on. Right. So he laughed at it. Mariko like got upset and left. Fuji is fighting. Anjin is frustrated. Um, Nagakato, do you remember how he reacted? He's in a couple of scenes, like he and Omi are shooting the shit about how badly they want to get into battle. Or in that Fuji scene, Naga is all about, man, I sure wish I did what your husband had done and stood up to that guy insulting my dad. He seems kind of sad, though. Like, Naga seemed excited and Omi seemed sad because he was the one that said that he wished that, like, things could go back to normal. Well, you know, (laughs) a few weeks ago, he was just running this little town. Mm-hmm. sleeping with cuckoo every so often you know he had the life he, he had a good job yeah i know and naga what did he have before this just following his like 
dad around who doesn't talk to him, just scolds him every once in a while. Okay, so again, we have that Nagakato enthusiastically asked if um, they shall die with blood on their sword. And that's when the quote happened. Why is it that only those who have never seen battle are so eager to be in one? Who said that? Pop quiz. I thought it was Torunaga. That makes me think that Torunaga, like when he said that, it made me think that I, I want to retract my statement of like the previous couple episodes or two ago when Nagakato um fired the cannons on the on the um on oh, the Josen. opposition yeah. on the messengers I think that and from yeah on Josen I think that that's when I realized like I don't think Toronaga would have done that I think he would have kept going like I think he probably had a plan um that was not going to have bloodshed because so far what we have seen is that this guy is trying to avoid that at all costs. And so him being annoying at his, annoyed at his son made me think, wow, I, I feel like this guy really isn't too proud of him. He was proud of Omi for being, um, for planting that seed and being decisive. But yeah, I take it back. I don't think that he would have shot them with the cannons. And I think he just really, really wants everything to be done. Um, Right. Okay. And then so we had Gein, right? And her method was was interesting because it seemed like she's the only one who was like, oh, there's going to be life after this. Post and Toronaga period. Well, post war, whether it's Toronaga winning or losing, right? Everyone's like, oh, when this war happens, we're all going to die. And it's the end of the world, basically. And she's the only one that's like, no, no, no. Let's let's think about the future. And so what did you think about that? Right. Because she's like in a lower class. She kept bringing up fate. The fate is a sword and, and my fate is written. Mm -hmm. No, fate is a sword. And like you said, trying to think of the Willow world and Edo and she has it all kind of thought out. And his reaction in the show was of particular interest to me because it was very different in the book. He did not treat this as just a novel distraction. He actually put some thought into his response because her whole plan was basically the birth of of what became geishas, that geishas mm -hmm. and courtesans would be different jobs. And that if you were picked at a, at a young girl to be a geisha, then you would learn certain ways to entertain men. But sex was an optional thing that the geisha could do or not do at her own discretion, whereas courtesans would stay with, 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 their, with their, whatever they were doing. And he was very interested in all that guild talk and setting it up in Edo and kind of being the champion of this of this new movement. Um, it took a lot of talking, but he was he was not as dismissive as he was in the show. Well, he was just dismissive in that moment. Well, he's got kind of bigger fish to fry right then. Exactly. Exactly. Which to me made a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> but right. yeah, the quote was um, fate is like a sword. Useful only to those who know how to wield it. And that was another indicator for me that this is all part of a grand plan because she was speaking to Toronaga in this conversation as like an equal. She knows exactly what he was doing. She called him out by saying, um, you know, any spy could have easily sent word about an approaching army. So why leave the weakened garrison so exposed? How could you make such a careless mistake? And he was annoyed. And I'm like, he's annoyed because she's a smart bee. And she um, like figured it out. No one else has figured it out. But maybe part of the reason she figured it out is because of, you know, what Ines said. She's part of this um, world is where people come and like expose themselves completely. Right. She knows all of the secrets. And so she has insight and on 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 what the reality actually is, what all of the faces are um, on these people. So I found that this scene kind of was when I decided, yeah, definitely. She's right. She's onto something. I respect her. She's confident. He could have said more to her. He could have struck that down, but he's just like, shut the fuck up, bitch. Like, let me do my thing. And then he showed that he respected her, right? By giving her those two plots in his will. What do you think she was on to though? There was like several things in motion here that you got to get the sequence right in order to place her observation 
correctly. Like he brought a small force to that fishing village. A lot of his force gets swallowed up by the earthquake. Meanwhile, he's causing political upheaval with the regents while he's there. So his plan was to have a smaller force with him there now, he didn't expect the earthquake to come. So she noticed that he had this exposed army. But what was the point? Was it that she could read what he was doing? And But what was he doing? So I think that his brother is part of this like grand plan of like he brought his army and now they're going to build their army like going back to Osaka. And I think that the rest of his people are like, somewhere else and they're going to help flank or just meet them in Osaka. Well, his real forces are in Edo. And he had his falcon, though. So we know he's sending messages. We know he's using it. They did bring the little birdie around. Well, they do so, use, um, um, not pigeons. What are they? Yeah, the falcons are for hunting, but you're right. They do have birds for long distance. Oh, yeah. They were pigeons. No. Were they pigeons? He looked like pigeons. I thought they were pigeons. They're not ravens, Inez. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so like when she said that to him. No. So, yeah, I think that um, he definitely has something happening in Edo because they keep referencing Edo. Yeah, you're right. He purposely left it over there. I think they're going to surround Osaka. I need mm. to check out the geography, but I think that's what's going to happen. However, as soon as he said, as soon as she said this, like, how could you make such a careless mistake? Like, she's like dissing on this man. He seemed annoyed. And that's when she apologized. And she's like, oh, sorry, I'm only an old whore. And like, my stick of time has run out. That to me, oh my God, I was just like applauding. She's just, she's just great. Like the subtlety in that, the, um, the meaning behind what she was saying, the respect between those two. I love that. She's like, Oh, I'm just a woman. I'm just a woman, Paul. <laughs> Man, and she I was really... able to get that big message in just one stick of time too. way to go, yeah. girl. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I just really have been contemplating a lot, it's especially the last episode I thought had some of the best acting in the in this season. And then in this episode, I realized like it's really just I just find the women's acting and their roles just so phenomenal. There's such, you know, and they're just such a art about them that I just like deeply respect and gain um, was was uh, exceptional as well. It's been so consistent. Just everyone is just phenomenal. Everyone on the production, all of all of the acting, all of the cinematography, all of the writing, the consistency. There are no mistakes. This is a masterpiece. A yeah, masterpiece. I think it's. Be, I, I think why I pay attention specifically, I'm paying attention to the female roles. Is I think it's because we don't really get this like this kind of screen time um, in Japanese um, filming in like the American eye, we are very used to seeing the samurai, this, the warrior, the ninjas, mm -hmm. you know, we're always about the men. And this one um, is such a beautiful um, integration of these women um, and these actresses who are in these roles are just so, amazing i love it i love this <laughs> so much yeah and on that note yabu yabu is amazing <laughs> i mean oh my god I love again him. living in the it. present <laughs> yes just like we're here for a bath guys it's bath time who brought the bubbles that was adorable <laughs> I mean, oh my god he was such a relief but i and and then um i like how nagakato and omi are just like following him around all the time did you notice that mm -hmm. well he's cool he's like the uh older uncle who lets them smoke <laughs> <laughs> i know but omi is really absorbing and learning and poor naga is just too eager and that that made me really sad that he's just like not ready to lead and it's just dripping all over him but Yabu and his confidence, that was, that was great. And I think, okay, so this was another thing, right? These, they're being like held captive, yeah. held hostage inside of this little, you know, area, their zone. But the, the soldiers, right? Like the, um, Saiki's 
people, forces, they, right? his forces, right. Like they are, um, like not aggressive. Like what are they doing? Even Fuji's allowed to like go into the trees and, and practice fighting, you know? So I was thinking what, what exactly is going on here? Why is there no, there's no like enforcement, there's no intimidation, so it was just a really interesting dynamic, I well, thought. Uh, that was sort of what I was getting at the beginning of this podcast about sort of the weird urgency level that has to do with maybe the propriety of the situation, honor, all that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. but it translates on TV to be like, why is this happening? They, they are blockading the city. So mm -hmm. you can't get out. You can't send a person to go say, hey, army, come help us. Um, you're either coming to Osaka in the next episode, or I imagine his forces ostensibly are there to slaughter Tornaga's guys if they don't come. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I didn't get that vibe. No. That it, second one. Yeah, it's weird because a lot of the instincts that I've had based off of <laughs> nothing besides watching a lot of TV and movies ha <laughs> have, have been kind of not correct with the way things play out in this culture. Like, for instance, when I, I, I thought that killing Josen would uh, result in a, in a swifter response mm -hmm. that would instigate conflict right away. Totally wrong. 100% wrong. That is not what happened at all. Um, mm -hmm. And it's that kind of thinking that makes me like very Realize interested to see. Realize how uncultured you are. There's that. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's that. But, but very interested to see what comes next. I know. Same, same. Then, you know, that's when Omi and Naga, like, had their spring time separately from Yabu. And our guy, Saiki, walked in on them. Right? That's when oh, that yeah. happened? Yeah, that's, so, that's it. That's when they were reminiscing. Um, like, Omi was reminiscing about, like, his life before. And I think that's where I saw the difference between those two. Like, I feel like in the beginning when we saw them together... Um, we, we thought, I thought that they were like on the same page of just like being eager to, whether it's to fight or to make someone proud or something. But it, again, here I saw them like going further apart from each other and their goals because Naga was super, super about, I want to die. I'm romanticizing death. And then Omi was romanticizing, um, like common life. And I think when Nagakato like said, oh yeah, when this place was a dump, like, cause when, you know, when he's, rom Omi's reminiscing and he's like, oh, do you like just a week or two ago, like life was this way. And then, Nag and then Nagakato is like, oh yeah, it was such a shithole. I feel like he didn't catch like, <laughs> um, that Omi like actually meant it. And so oh no, that was, yeah, you're right. Yeah. They were, that was, uh, interesting to me. And also why I think that, um, Omi probably just wants to do everything it takes to get back to his life. And he's going to do whatever, whatever it takes. And I think that he actually is the one who planted the seed in Nagakato during this springtime conversation. Oh, his uncle did successfully kind of keep turning the screw on him and kind of belittling him. There was, yeah, the combination of just his eagerness and the, and then there, there, like the scene we already mentioned with Fuji mm -hmm. where he's like, I sure wish I had stood up for my dad. And, you know, his dad surrenders. And that's when he decides, apparently, from what we've been shown anyway, that's when he decides to take action in the tea house. It's the difference that I just kind of noticed between the two guys is like, if it's true that Naga's been learning how to be Tornaga's son for his whole life, he's, he might've had kind of an easy life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can oh tell. yeah, totally. Yeah. It was uh, every, a lot of, every, um, a lot of what he says has, is tone deaf. Um, the conversation Gabby just mentioned w with Omi, you know, calling the place a shithole is because he doesn't have the um, perspective of what it takes to put your blood, sweat and tears into like running something with very limited knowledge like Omi ha had to do. Um, and then when he has that conversation with Fuji, you know, saying that he, he wish it was him that did it so that his um, 
he could have died um, instead. But I feel like it's still just about his own personal honor for him, yeah. not really because he was trying to be comforting to her. It's because he has the romanticized, he has romanticized what his death is going to be um, and what, what his death should be like which mm, as yeah. we saw play out here right <laughs> well wow, so powerful scene. before that though one quote that i think was important was when omi said um like all the good things we had are gone because we tried to reach for more and that's when naga immediately just like didn't like was tone deaf and then just mentioned that um you know his uncle is a spineless pig and he can't wait to like get them back and then um that's when his uncle Saiki showed up and then reminded them that like he and Toronaga have their troubles but they're still family after all and so that again was another indicator to me that I'm like you and Toronaga have something going on like you guys the emphasis of like this alliance this like the fact that they both are on the same page that they want everything to end and then they are still family and there's to me i don't know this was a big red flag i could be totally wrong but <laughs> it also made me think that like maybe they're planning on using nagakato as like a leverage in the future because he's so eager and they're letting him like they're not telling him they're not shutting him down i think that at this point they're just letting him do whatever he's going to do i don't think they expected him to a assassin like to attempt to assassinate anybody but i just thought like to me it just felt like there are two things happening right now two realities and like saiko and toranaga are on one plane and everyone else is somewhere else because he said that death is a lonely path in the woods so that's just like to me shows that he really wants to avoid it at all costs there's nothing nothing great about it but anyway then my guy my guy yabu right he's trying to be a hero and teach blackthorn how to fight that was adorable that was you, you'd think you'd start with sticks, though, R right? What? No, I wouldn't think that. You don't think? <laughs> They're Yabu. about to, like, die, like, potentially die tomorrow, right? Because <laughs> this is, like, we're leaving to tomorrow. This. Right, and he has to learn how to use this sword, um, or this katana. And so the yeah. only way to learn that is to, like, have it. But yeah, Yabu let his walls down. And I like how he was like, narrating the whole time. He's like, I I'm know. picking up the sword. <laughs> I know. This and then he's happening. like, why am I talking to you? It's like pissing in the wind. <laughs> uh, it was so good. It was, good it was, that was so good. I can rewatch that scene forever and be so happy. Oh my gosh. He's so great. His character, the character development in this show is phenomenal. Even Blackthorn, right? Because he showed up so, you know, confident and, and completely like out of touch with the reality he was in. And now, I mean, he's, he's part of it. He's defeated. He's, he's wanting to be He's wanting to die. Like he drank the Kool Aid. Like he understands the culture. I think he's honorable. He's getting there. He sees and he understands a lot, but he doesn't understand why in a lot of cases yet. <laughs> but sorry, um, when when they're fighting and then he knocks the katana out of his hand and he's just and then Blackthorn is like, I don't know, stumbling on his words. <laughs> so funny when yabu's like i don't know a word you're saying pick it up like he's just like <laughs> we're gonna fight get your shit together i loved it i love that he was doing what he needed to do he's always doing what he needs to do but then yabu had to come and shoot his shot which i thought was really interesting that he Buntaro? yeah buntaro came in and yeah. shot a shot with trying to get our guy do you think that he would have killed him if yabu wasn't there he seems like on the last hair's breadth of control like he's just right there obviously mm -hmm. otherwise he wouldn't have advanced on on blackthorn like that 
without Blackthorn being armed and with Buntaro still being honorable, I don't think he'd kill him, but and like he's right there. Obviously, he wouldn't, he wouldn't ask for permission to kill him in, this, in the next scene. So, I mean, he's just right there. But no, I don't think he would have killed him. I think he would have done pretty much what he did. Just get right up to that edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, intimidate. Well, I love that. <laughs> Yabu, last last quote for right now. You would have died if I wasn't here, you idiot. Like, <laughs> I loved that. He's just like, let me make it about me because I started this. I'm going to end it. <laughs> you didn't think that was hilarious? Oh, I, I, I liked Yabu a lot more in this episode than I had previous episodes. That's for sure. The confidence of, of when he strips down and gets into the spring to, to bathe. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of naked guys in this episode. And um, it's interesting to see how um, <laughs> this is just a, a, a crass body judgment. But they're a lot smaller without their samurai suits on, aren't they? They're like huge in the samurai outfits. But when they, when they finally get in the bath, they're like skinny. I mean, they have to be fit in order to carry all that stuff. I was not surprised at all. Yabu is meant to be, and, and I think they chose a good actor in this because he wasn't actually that fit. He had kind of a middle-aged belly on him, but he's meant to be deceptively like that. He's, he's meant to be yeah. that kind of swordsman that you would think wouldn't get an advantage on you, but will and always would. He didn't last that long being a pushover. Yeah, and so this scene, I think, displayed one of the themes that I was bringing up is like earlier, which was how everyone in their defeated phase, right? What mm -hmm. what do people do when they're already dead? And we saw that Yabu is just living his best life. Love that. And then Buntaro you want to hear a story is... just about like that from me, my my history yes. that relates to, to Yabu. Yes, I, I was trying out for high school band. And I was in eighth grade and I thought I was pretty hot shit, right? Wait, what did you play? Drums. And Oh, yes, yes. And so um, it was time to play the xylophone piece. I had not practiced enough, but I could play the piece. And what happened was I just kind of, my mallets kind of got twisted up in front of me and I, and I just shat the bed just could not play it and in the middle of that knowing that i had just screwed up there's only like seven people sitting here and i wanted to be the best of them but i was definitely not going to be now because i had fumbled on the xylophone i laughed i was like <laughs> and the band director got so pissed he like he was he was behind like a curtain to make it like a blind thing. And he like comes around and is like, who laughed? And it's like, uh. <laughs> yeah, so that was not a great way to meet the band director. And But that was the same sense of fatalism that's like, well, God damn it, I just, this was like a one-time thing. For Yabu, it's his life. For me, it was just the, you know, band tryouts. But same sort of idea, right? Is got, all, all I could do in that moment of having screwed myself was was laugh. And that's, I think I can appreciate that with Yabu in this mm -hmm. situation. Yeah, if you're on at the nice, you may as well dance. There you go. Yabu is living his best life. And Blackthorn, though, he's unenthusiastic and really showing his defeated side. I think he was ready to die. And I like how he said, like, it may as well be now, you know. So there's a lot of animosity happening between them. And it's it's a huge weight on him, especially since I think Mariko is giving him, like, the colder shoulder, too. So that was sad yeah. for me. Yeah. And the next scene I did put, Buntaro shows up with, quote, uh, urgent, unquote, business. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, I mean, like, He's in the middle of needing to, to try to <laughs> consider what to do with his entire clan. That's what he's supposed to be doing right there. He's like, man, my wife and this guy. And it's like, do I need to be talking about this right now? You know, I just posed a question for myself or, you know, I guess like with you guys, you know, last time we saw Buntaro, um, he was being really vile. Um, in his words that he was choosing to describe Mariko's family and her background, just like really a lot of anger, resentment, embarrassment, because he's the husband of 
um, a woman whose family is treacherous and they all should have died, including her, but she got spared because of being married to him. Like it was just very, that, that animosity of, of how I feel like he feels toward Mariko is really just really horrible. But he also like refuses to say that she is a complicit party in whatever kind of inappropriate relationship might exist between her and Anjan. And so my question to you is like, is this, you know, is this just like, why, why is he protecting Mariko if he is so resentful to her? Um, is this like because he his pride is hurt severely or do you think it's because he actually does have like a real affection for her somewhere that we just haven't seen mm -hmm. what do you think well i think love and hate are just sides of the same coin so yeah i think as much as he hates that he loves her there is a scene in the book that totally confused me because the rest of the relationship between Buntaro and Mariko is the exact same as the show. Beats her up in that one scene. They are very cold with each other. There's no actual relationship between them. Except there's this one scene where they meet in the woods and they explain how much they love each other to each other, both of them. It carries on in this moment where they thought that they might just both commit seppuku right then together oh, and weird. go into death together. And it was like, what? Where's this coming from? If it happens mm -hmm. in the show, I, I, I would be highly surprised <laughs> because it just didn't make any sense in the book either. Because right when that scene was done, they went back to the way they were treating each other. Oh, my gosh. That's funny. That yeah. was him being like, hey, guys, it's deeper. It's a cultural thing. I think that was just... Well, Buntaro, he was only going to do that in the woods away from everyone else because that was the only way he could express what he needed to say and do with her. And she reciprocated. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it was completely like, took me off. Like, what am I, am I... I had to rewind it for a second and be like, am I listening to the right people? Is this what's happening here? Because it's yeah, just... Yeah, so confusing. Yes, it was. They don't know how to love. They've never been given the opportunity. All they know their whole lives is repression. So they both have a lot of stress. So even if there is any sort of affinity or there is definitely respect between them, um, but their lives are so different. Their struggles are so unique. There's no overlap that I think that the idea of love, both like for each of them, is just, just impossible. Like, neither of them know what that is. They've never felt it from anybody. They've never expressed it with anybody. So I I think it's kind of like, it is what it is. And it can't be anything more. And it could never have been anything more because of who they are and where their life took them. But right before this, though... Um, we saw, uh, we already mentioned like Nagakato when he was walking um, back through the woods and we found Fuji um, in the woods practicing. And that's when he said, hey, you're still hurt. Like you're mm -hmm. too hurt to practice, right? Um, and then he said, yeah, like if only he was brave like her husband. Her response to him was, um, we do what we can when we can and only when we are able to. We can only hope it's enough. And he like looked really, really sad at that. And so that to me was maybe a moment where I thought like he felt that he absolutely like foreshadowing the future where he absolutely has to um, act and do something. I think she like, I think maybe Omi, I said earlier that I thought Omi planted the seed um, but I think that this was kind of a moment where it's possible that Naga like confirmed that that's what was going to happen or maybe decided to like scheme more with Omi about it after this. I think it was really significant that she said that and gave him words of wisdom that probably impacted the future. Right. She. I. <laughs> it's funny how words can mean different things to different people, right? Absolutely hilarious. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
like I don't know that she meant go stage a uh, an assassination attempt on your uncle. I don't know that that's what she meant, but that's what he heard. Right, right. Sorry. So I just wanted to like bring that up really quick. But like we could totally let's let's mo- move back to the next scene, which was um, <laughs> Buntaro and his priorities. Hmm, the the part that I had a question about for you two was how the logic that Tornaga employs to prevent Buntaro from killing Blackthorn says, well, then you'd have to kill your wife too. I think that's just like a cultural thing, probably. You think so? I, yeah, it's it, like illegal. Because it came up like, I don't know, it seemed bullshitty to me, like, because he valued Mariko and wasn't done with her yet. I mean, it totally could have been like a, like his, his conditions, you know, it could have totally been just him put, imposing a condition, but the way that he worded it, Toronaga yeah. worded, said, worded it, made it, this. yeah, made it sound like it was like a known kind of like law mm-hmm. or something. Yeah. Um, but it's, his, his, yeah, and it's his prerogative of like how he wants to um, enforce the law enforce the law and because Bataro is like one of his, his top guys you know so he is super valuable so he needs to make sure as a leader he's putting on a show enough of like I'm taking your thing into real consideration but as like you're a leader you have to like do this stuff and maybe he does know something about you know that Buntaro doesn't hate me. Maybe he knows something about Buntaro's hidden affection for Marco somewhere that we haven't seen. I don't know, but I I I interpret it as it was some kind of like cultural law. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, um, I think right. it's totally law. And then I mean, because yeah. she reminded, because he asked her like, "Well, what do you think of this?" And she said, "This life of mine is for my husband to take if he chooses." So. There you go. Yeah, because She's Mariko is so valuable to Torunaga, I think that Torunaga did make a point of adding like visibility to conditions um, to make it happen. But because I feel like in the same breath, if Mariko was nothing to Torunaga at all, um, and he didn't have any use for her, mm-hmm. I think he would have probably just said, "Well, she's your wife. You do what you want." <laughs> you know, or some I don't know, right? Like he's like, yeah, yeah, go, go take. It. I mean, I feel like maybe, maybe there is like an intentionality where he's like being a super strict interpreter of the law in this case because he still has utility to take from Marco and Anjan, and I like calling him Anjan oh. more than Blackthorn now. <laughs> See, there's another oh event God. in the book that is worth knowing that happened by now in the story which is that Blackthorn had come to Toranaga and asked him to divorce Buntaro and Mariko. He didn't agree to do it, but he had said, will you divorce them to his face? So it was like an, it was like out there kind of thing. Yeah. And I do remember that like I was, when I was learning about the guy Blackthorn is like based on, they did say that he asked Toranaga like if he could be with Mariko. So Maybe this is part of that. Maybe. Theory. Yeah. But in, sorry, go ahead. The love story aspect of those two is being put through more of a ringer in the show than the author put into the book. In the book, they just, <laughs> they just let the love flow at, at about the midpoint on. Oh, like everybody knew? It was. They're open about it? It, it was a well-known secret. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting that vibe in this, that it's a well-known secret. They're just like, you know, sticking to their culture, which is you still, there's gossip happening. And I think we get glimpses of it. But yeah, behind the scenes, like people are talking, word is spreading very quickly. Yeah, Um, because Gene brought it up about the tea house. That's right. His his mind was somewhere else. Uh, yeah, on another. whatever. She did not have to do that. But <laughs> no, um, so no, interesting though, just like right after, like with what we're talking about with that conversation with Buntaro and Toronaga about Mariko. Um, after that though, like, because Inez, you said that if she was just nobody, then he would be like, okay, cool, whatever. Sure, but, you know, he seemed really annoyed at Mariko and she responded, I am your servant regarding all matters. And then he got mad and he's like, when the barbarian is involved, he said, when the barbarian is involved, like, 
we are one thing. Are you with me in this fight against your father's enemies or are you with the barbarian? I order you to choose. That was really interesting to me because I'm like, what is this affinity he has with her? Because this was like a new side of him. He usually calls um, Blackthorn Anjin. He didn't. He got fed up. He sounded like a jealous guy. I don't know, like, in mm. what capacity he's jealous. But then, um, you know, she immediately, like, to me, I was really, like, offended because I'm thinking, like, well, we know what she's been up to. And I really think she has been 100%, like, um, loyal to him doing everything he asks. And so, um, and then she said, yeah, like, Lord, I have served you loyally to my best ability, but I beg you. And then she twisted it, right? And she's like, every moment that passes, I wait for death. Tonight, I ask that you allow it to come to an end. Will you do me this last kindness? Will you um, free me from this cursed life? And I think he was probably upset that she's like not wanting to live for him. Mm, um, interesting. Hmm. And then because he got pissed at her and then knocked that out of her hand. I was like, Jesus, guy. Like, I know it was super subtle, but coming from him, it was a big deal. Yeah, and then the rain picked up when he when he stormed yeah. out of the tent and the rain picks up. Right. And so I forgot. I, I do plan on looking up, like, if there is any symbolism, if, like, rain has any symbolism, like, culturally, because I thought that was... um definitely an interesting touch but however in this scene though we did skip over um something i thought was important before buntaro came and made that request um we heard toronaga giving his um will yeah 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 and so far the wills have been referenced right everyone writes the wills and then it just like skips past them we haven't heard at all like what is in a will so i thought that was important um, and probably foreshadowing. And so he said that all of his land should be passed to his grandchildren when they become of age. And he's had like a lot of yeah, children, right? So, and they're all yeah. in Edo protected, right? Yeah. And then um, the important part was that um, Gein would get two cho of land and she may use it however she wishes. That was huge. And even Mariko like looked at him like, like, I don't know. I, I, I kind of teared up in that moment. <laughs> I think Mariko like was emotional. It was subtle, but I was really curious. Like what, if you remember that, like, what do you think she was thinking in that moment? Hmm. She's asking you, Ines. <laughs> <laughs> I was taking a moment to kind of think it over as well. Um, what is Mariko thinking, listening to Torinaga include Gin in his will? Um, I mean, I'm sure that it was very surprising. It feels like... Um, this is uh, kind of like a revolutionary moment of history for a woman that she's witnessing. I don't know if she particularly thinks of it as that in that moment, but it is so unlikely and uncommon. And I don't know what the rules are about, you know, and I have to look it up the, the history of of women owning property um, back at this time in in Japan, because we all know that in the United States, it took a long time for women to be able to own property, right? So this is 1600. I wonder if her receiving this kind of inheritance um, is is um, just really like brand new, maybe. So mm. maybe it's just kind of surprised from like that perspective. I'm, I'm just making assumptions about the- Or even what the connection is that would merit um, a bequeathment such as that. Yeah, maybe her mm -hmm. curiosity because she doesn't. She wasn't there for the conversation, so she doesn't know what, why he yeah. would be doing that. So just like a shock. From yeah. That. Yeah, and actually, I just looked it up, and apparently, rain is a symbol for renewal and growth in the Japanese culture. Hmm. Well, that's and interesting timing then. 
Yes, yes, very calculated, I think. Excellent, excellent writing. But one other thing about this scene that I noticed uh, that I never noticed before, I see them, the women gliding. I like the technical aspects of um, this, like authenticity with like the cultural representation. And so I appreciated how she was standing. Did you see her feet? You, you're going to have to go back and look at that. But it was... Um, it was really neat seeing how uncomfortable, I mean, she, her feet looked really uncomfortable, but it was cool to see like how the women like had to stand in order to maintain a certain type of posture and flow versus the men. So yes, hmm. I encourage you to go back to that scene and I look at her standing to. before Buntaro shows up. I, I do not remember her feet placement in that scene. Wow, I can't wait for you to look. Anyway, so yeah, okay. We went back a little bit. Toronaga, angry at our girl, and then knocks the dagger out of her hand. He walked out in the rain. Renewal. Maybe the renewal, like the rain, maybe was like symbolic of the future, right? Like what's going to happen in his will because he did set like a new standard. And she told him, she, um, Gein inspired him and actually just told him exactly what to do to set that new standard. So I feel like that was that was an important moment that I think we should appreciate. Take a moment to appreciate. Thank you, writers. Thank you, director. Thank well, you. Well, maybe that's um translating the long discussion about geishas and guilds and all that into action on screen, but with much mm -hmm. fewer words. Yes. <laughs> all right. Two scenes left to go, unless Gabby needs to back up to the beginning of the episode again. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I mean, I do have some questions that I wanted to ask you guys, like, at the end. All right. Next scene is the big surrender. All the guys are there, full armor. I was kind of wondering, like, who do you suppose puts up the banners and the seats and the fires and everything to get everything situated for these kinds of uh, ceremonies do you think they're, they're samurai do you think they're just townspeople do you think there's like a town you know, operations team yeah like a meetings tech of the <laughs> yeah and something. i think they're the samurai i think the samurai have like a group that are designated for that you think so because they're they're just so i was i was just uh, impressed looking at, at how uh, convincing the whole set looked yeah it was so good right i was paying attention a lot to that too i was even like thinking about when they were deciding like you know how to like uh make it look a little bit worn you know showing like the little kind of like holes in the seams and yeah. everything it just was had such a very authentic look and um th in the the bird eye view um from from that scene um gosh that was like i made note of that i just really enjoy the cinematography choices that they had within there transitioning to landscape and then the fog which is this, the beautiful fog along the water um but yeah i i did have like spent a time in my head just admiring the setup of that outdoor council space right and then in this scene this very beautiful scene right right before he um surrenders he did have that conversation with um hiromatsu yes he had that conversation with hiromatsu and we saw their friendship and the lightheartedness which was sad that they were reminiscing about these like horrible violent like stories um but yeah i mean the fact that it was so sweet, like this vulnerability between these guys when, you know, he said he told like he asked why Hiramatsu didn't speak up um, when he told the story. And Hiramatsu is like, oh, I'm sorry that I should have defended you. And then he kind of laughed and said, no, the other one. And that's when Hiromatsu said, I believe it was nine tries before that head came off. What a fucking mess you made. And then they laughed and he's like, you know, Tanaga said, who picks a young child to be their second? That I feel like was such a powerful, sad scene, right? Because you're thinking like, wow, that's your life. Your life is flashing before your eyes in this moment when you're about to surrender and you know you're going to die as far as what I thought in the moment at first. And 
these are the memories that they have. Like that's just, you know, insight on the culture and the time. And I thought that was really powerful. Blackthorne's reaction to this. If there's anything like Book Blackthorn, he's never, ever going to be on the inside track. <laughs> no, knowing mm-hmm. anyone's motivations for doing anything. He may learn way, way, way after the fact how things went down. But in this moment, all he knows is what he's being shown, which is that the boss is surrendering and surrender means death. He storms off. I mean, after after all of that groundwork that had been laid for the previous part of the episode with tell the barbarian to shut up, make sure he wears his swords, no pistols, blah, blah, blah. Um, it almost seems like you might not even invite him to this, um, <laughs> this, oh, yeah. this, this part if you're worried. And then this is the part where he does get up and storm off. Yeah, I definitely think he wants to protect him, but I feel like he would have to invite him still somehow. Hatamoto. It's like at a distance. Yeah. Right. Because he is Hatamoto and he is like in charge of the cannons. And again, I think that he's going to attack Osaka when he gets there. But Blackthorn stood up and then Yabu did too. Were you surprised by that? Mm-hmm. Yabu and Naga both stood up. I was. He didn't do anything threatening. And he, in fact, used the uh, Sama designation, which I assume means deference, respect, to both mm-hmm. of those men before he took his leave. So it, well, it, they knew that he wasn't going to make some dumb move, but maybe they didn't know when they stood up. Oh, yeah, for sure. But I just thought that Yabu stood up because he was like being... Actually, I don't know. I don't know if he was being honorable, but he really cared about um, Toronaga surrendering. So I guess maybe he stood up because he's like, oh, no, if you surrender, then I'm the next one to die. So that was probably it. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) Anyway, though, when he said, like, I've made my decision, even when there is evil in this land, it is my firm belief no one has the right to tear the realm apart. Crimson Sky was a mistake. I thought, oh, man, does this mean that he has a better plan than Crimson Sky? I think that is what that means. I interpreted Blackthorn's moment as foreshadowing. He gave us a reminder that Todanaga is the Lord of Trickery, uh, you know, because he can speak so freely because nobody understands him. Yeah. So when he's just like running through the list of these things now, to me, that was like from a writer perspective, I felt like I was being set up for foreshadowing that like Todanaga's got a plan there's something going on that i mean i was i felt the curiosity about that possibility back when he was saying i'll give you an answer you know tomorrow and then you know they're like okay we're gonna take you tomorrow you know so it was like adding all this time and everything and i just thought he's just like waiting holding back and taking a look at stuff and then blackthorn drops this and he's very clearly lord of trickery and I think that was meant to be a reminder to us as an audience of yeah, who Toranaga well. is. I didn't make a connection that it could be Saiki as a possibility, but after this conversation today, I definitely feel like there's a good 50-50 chance of that. But it's definitely something. There's something that's that's going to happen. I don't know what it is exactly, but I didn't feel like this was a sincere surrender. And like I said, this is where I think it starts to diverge from what happens in the book. This does happen in the book, but it's it's a stall. It's a, how long can I put off actually getting to Osaka? Mm-hmm. It'll be a month before they're, they're actually knowing that I'm holding them up. But in this case, his brother's like, we're leaving tomorrow, you know? So the, the, the stalling aspect, I think, is already being headed off n- narratively thrilled to see what comes next because this part of the book kind of (laughs) dragged and uh without the love story there at least not developing in the same way that it does in the book then a lot of that material is is not going to work the same way so i think what i'm going to see coming up is going to be completely new how many guys were there with naga did you notice enough or just a couple it felt like a handful it didn't feel like it would i mean i I think we saw two people for sure on the screen besides naga right and i'm thinking maybe there's like two more around there yeah that's what i was thinking because what i was wondering is you know we know that naga takes himself out is there enough guys left to finish the job or 
is this going to go really, really badly? And Saki's going to be like, hey, your son tried to kill me last night. What's up? You just skipped one important part, right? And it was that during that intimacy scene, Kiku bowed out of this. Oh, yeah. And yeah. she obviously knew what was coming. Yeah. She's like, I need to go to the dildo room. And he's like, all right, show me more. That's why I think this is Omi's doing. Like Omi planting the seed into Naga's head and well, Naga decided. Once. Yeah. With the... And Naga, de- yeah. And so Naga decided, oh, I'm just going to get like a few guys. I think it was a few. And I think that they got taken out during their fighting because I think that his brother and Tornaga um, are conspiring together. It's just going to kind of be one of those situations of like, look at this unfortunate thing that happened because this boy was not ready. But I think that maybe this is now an other opportunity because now they have Naga's head. And so we see like heads being passed around. I don't want to sound insensitive, but I feel like maybe they can use his son's body or his head like for the next part of their scheme. Because Mm -hmm. I think that like Saiki could have done something and he like didn't want to. You know, he was ordered to commit seppuku. And so the proof of that would have been sending his head um Mm -hmm. it's handy that he's already dead (laughs) pun intended (laughs) right (laughs) exactly so unfortunately like i don't think that it was meant to happen but i think that this was kind of there's like silver lining in this moving forward do you think that psyche is like part of the conspiring with Toronaga, or do you think that like say you you are on board with my theories or do you think that this is now going to be an opportunity for Toronaga to somehow win over Saiki's army and use the head as like sending it first before they go like goodwill like well my son committed suicide so give me another week and then I'll be along like that yeah, because they have like rituals as well. Like when someone dies, you have to bring them back to like where they're from and maybe somehow that'll buy them time. Maybe. Like I said, he stalls in the book. That's what he does. He stalls okay. during this portion. Oh, it seems like our little man Naga is going to like have a purpose. Like he wouldn't have died in vain, which was this this yeah i know said it this last scene it was it was a lot and it was beautiful and it was a lasting meaningful ending head wounds bleed a lot so i mean do you think it was ironic that naga tripped over that robe because they have all types of robes that they wear and this one was like a night robe and he was wearing that night robe doing this like intimate thing where he's like his, his most like vulnerable and when he was at his most vulnerable, that's what saved him because Naga slipped on it. I just read it more like just being in, in a rush, needing to rush at death. <laughs> and not so, so haphazardly, he couldn't even set his feet. So he s- steps on slippery rock with cloth on it and kills himself. Yeah. And then the first thing his, his uncle says is someone explained to me, where's the beauty in this? That was a huge indicator to me, too, that he's, like, in on ending the war. And I think he knows that Toronaga is going to go that route. Hmm. So I think he's going to turn on Nishido. Even if he doesn't stall, right? Even if they just march up to Osaka, the regents would still need to pass their sentence on Toronaga. And with his brother as a regent, well, if he's in on it, right— but they still mm-hmm. go through with the whole process, then he could still vote, no, I don't want my brother to kill himself. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. a very boring procedural way to get there, but <laughs> but but that's, but that's possible. Yeah, and with the way things have gone, you know what? It's probable too, Paul. <laughs> they follow their due process. <laughs> what, what, what were your questions that, that you wanted to ask at the end of the episode, Gabby? Speaking of Ido, we already mentioned this, but what useful people are in Ido that weren't sent to Ajiro? And then do you think that they are going to be the ones that like turn the tides for Tonanaga? Well, I believe that it is that Edo is his capital. You know, it is his main base. 
I don't know that he traveled with his entire army when he came to check out the ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he didn't. And so I have to have word, right? Yeah, I'd imagine that it is his, the bulk of his forces are there. So that's, yeah, the importance of Edo at this point. And then um, do you think that Taranaga is going to think that like someone influenced his son to attack his brother? Or do you think that he's going to think that Naga like did it himself? And if so, if you think that Toronaga is going to think he was influenced, do you think he's going to care? How much is that going to matter? I'm going to say predictable kind of way of like the same way that he found out about when his son killed Josen and crew. You know, yeah. some... Except Naga's dead now, though. Right. Naga's dead now, but there's still like people, witnesses. He's going to get the information. I feel like maybe there's not going to be much layers to this other than it's just he has a track record of trying to tell his son to quit being so like impulsive and blind and immature. And this just kind of like falls right into Nagakato's reputation with his dad Demo, at this yeah. point. Man, I think there's something to that. So do you think Toronaga is going to think like, oh, Omi did this? And will he have a problem with that? I guess is directly what I'm asking. Mm. Are you saying you don't think he'll have a problem that Omi made his son basically kill himself? I think that he has been holding his son accountable for his actions very aggressively, very assertively. So... Um, well, he's his, been protecting his, him. Well, he has been teaching him and frustrated with him in these teachings and, re and reminding him who he like needs to be, but he has to keep inter, but Tonaga keeps finding himself having to intervene in, in places to protect his son because his son is doing the same impulsive acting without thinking, you know, kinds of things like even the gesture of like accepting the seppuku order. So I think that this is, he'll probably just for consistency sake, probably just still hold this to Nagakado's accountability. He might have a question, you know, since there is a pattern there of rash behavior and being pushed into it. He did say that his son isn't like smart enough to come up with this, this sort of plan on his own, like when the Josen thing happened. So I don't know if he's going to think that his son was smart enough to come up with this on his own either. I guess what I'm gathering by your answer is that he's like not going to care or hold anyone else accountable. He's just going to be like, okay, it happens now he's out of the way. It happened and now I have to pivot. Are you thinking that he is going to hold animus against uh, Omi? It would be consistent if he did. But again, who knows because he's about to go to war. So he he's going to find some silver lining probably, which is what we said might happen. And then I had... Another question. Do you think that Mariko is like at any point, like she's translating for Blackthorn and their relationship seems to be like, go, I don't know, having some tension and friction. Obviously they're both unhappy. So I was just curious though, if you think that in any of the translations, if she's like trying to protect Anjin from Buntaro or Omi or Yabu, because she knows like everyone's a schemer. Like, do you think at all, like at this point, she's translating to protect him for anything? I do, because of the way that she's always paraphrased what he says, especially if there's like a cultural sensitivity issue there with the way that he's put something, she'll reword it to be something that the uh, intended listener wouldn't take offense to. And I think she's continuing to do that if we don't see that necessarily with those characters. And when he says things that are correct, she did actually say them word for word in this episode. Mm -hmm. And then um, finally, do you think that Todonaga is, and we did already talk about this, but do you think that he's supposed to be like losing it in this episode? Like his, is he regressing to like him being a young samurai where like he does his duties, but it's not enough? Or what do you think like the significance of like his flashbacks is well, i think you nailed it earlier the war weariness and if we can assume that tornaga is actually iomasu takugawa then this little revolution that he wins historically results in like 250 years of peace in japan so if that's the guy that inspired tornaga then yeah the guy just doesn't want to fight any more than he has to anymore and he's had a long life of fighting. 
All right. Well, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am and sir. All right. Well, that is another episode of what's the name of this show? Shogun. (laughs) (laughs) It's getting late here, folks. Um, Shogun in the books, episode seven. That was a stick of time. This episode probably runs for 30 or 40 sticks of time. So you need a lot of sticks if you're if you're measuring time that way and listening to our podcast. Yeah. And I just want to add, I'm so sorry, just to end it. This episode to me was so beautiful. I actually cried at the end. It was just so much. It was a masterpiece to me. So I need a shout out to everybody working on this. (laughs) It was really well made. Just like how uh, both of you were saying earlier, like the, the way that you could tell the colors, something about the way that they had the ground and the flowers and the but the fog and then their costumes created a very kind of painterly impressionist feel in a lot of scenes especially with it raining throughout it was never bright and allowing colors to have like their full bright value they were all kind of muddy but when things did stand out it was like like you mentioned with the silver uniforms or gray uniforms it was really thoughtfully put together that's an understatement (laughs) Well, if you like this podcast, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to it on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a review, leave us a comment, and if it's a good one, we'll even read it on the podcast. Please come back next week and we'll pick up with the eighth episode of the season. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening. This has been an original Pod Clubhouse production. Pod Clubhouse is a podcast network dedicated to encouraging collaboration among podcasters and friends to bring a fresh voice and diverse perspective on a wide array of content. Please visit and leave a comment for us at podclubhouse.com. Rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast feeds on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Pod Clubhouse. Our DMs are always open, and we'd love to hear from you.